Hello. Hello. Selamat tengari. Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, I'm uh, Richard Wee from Richard Wee Chambers. Together with me is my colleague and partner, uh, Marisa Raza. Hi, everyone. Hi. Thank you for logging in. Uh, I'm sure there are many more people uh, tuning in in, in due course. Uh, today's uh, webinar is a very special one. Absolutely nothing to do with law, uh, which is refreshing because you know lawyers end up talking only about law it can be quite boring. Uh, so today we're having two uh, outstanding stakeholders in their respective industry, uh, Mr. Christopher Ling and Mr. Ronald Ling, who will be with us. But before that, uh, a quick introduction. As I said, I'm, I'm Richard Wee. Uh, we are a law firm in Petaling Jaya, and uh, my colleague Mao. Hi everyone, I'm Marla Saraza here. I'm one of the partners at Richard Wee Chambers as well. Very excited for today's talk. So yeah, let's go ahead. Let's do this when, yeah. So as I said earlier, uh, thanks Mal. Uh, we have two outstanding stakeholders in their respective industry. Uh, hi Chris, how are you Chris? Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm doing well, thank you. All right, I love your backdrop, but I'm sure it's, it's a real backdrop, right? Not a one of those. Real, 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 promise, promise. <laughs> <laughs> hi, hi, Ron. How are you, Ron? Hi, hi. I'm good. How's everyone? Yeah. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, today's webinar, before I invite the speakers to introduce themselves, uh, Mal and I will be having uh, conducting this by way of an interview. It's like a talk show. Uh, and the dialogue will be discussed. We will be discussing about the impact of the pandemic on uh, events and performing arts. We have noticed for quite some time that these two industries have been um, facing a huge challenge uh, as it is a very people-centric, very spectator-centric. Um, so we would like to uh, perhaps hear their views and uh, let the speakers share their vision of what they expect 2021 to be. Um, so without further ado, can I invite uh, Chris, Leong, uh, Chris Ling? Chris, can you... Uh, I almost call Chris Leong, that's my friend. Chris Ling. <laughs> Hi, no worries, I've been called many other names too. <laughs> um, hi, uh, thank you so much for having me on this, uh, in, in this part of your program. Um, uh, my name is Chris Ling. I am the Artistic Director of Theatre 360, which is a local uh, Malaysian theatre collective. Uh, we say collective because the running joke about Theatre 360 is that we are in a new old theatre company because all the stakeholders in the company are all people who have been working in theatre for many, many, many years now. Uh, Theatre 360 is six years, six years old. We celebrate, celebrated our sixth birthday on uh, at the end of March, uh, at the very start of the, of the first MCO this year. Um, we are new in the sense that uh, Theatre 360 uh, actually started out as branding for the, the, the whole group of us. So there are, there, are, there are actually right now three of us, myself and my two company partners. And uh, we also run a venue in Subang Jaya uh, called Loting as well. Um, about myself, well, uh, without sounding like a bio data, uh, I, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this interesting fact uh, rather than spill the beans on all my stuff. Um, the very first play I directed, which was in 1987, was actually the result of a press gang. I was shanghaied by my class teacher and asked to direct our classes English drama interclass competition entry. Uh, I, I, I'm an alumni from a La Salle uh, School, PJ, which is very famous for, uh, I mean, well, well known for its theater and drama previously. But uh, I was literally pressed gang into, into doing that. So, uh, and, and now I'm here. I don't know how that happened, but anyway, call it what you may. But that was, that was, the, that was the start of it all, all the way back then, yeah. What an interesting story, Chris, well done. So, effectively, you accidentally no la, no la, not exactly la. I have to be honest, my, my favorite movie actually is E.T. the Extraterrestrial. Oh, and uh, oh, I wow. fell in love with the movie and I said, hey, you know, you know, who, who can I be? Can I be Henry Thomas, the actor who gets to meet the alien? Or do I become the megalomaniac Steven Spielberg who's so talented <laughs> and so awesome? Oh my God, you know. And, yeah. But what I decided was, I sat, the, I remember this, I sat in the back seat of my dad's car and I, I, I asked myself, would you like to do theater or would you like to do film? And I decided on theater because you get to know the audience reaction almost immediately, right? I mean, if they don't like you, they throw mm. things at you, right? Or they tell you to get lost. <laughs> Whereas with a film, you've got, okay, okay. And I mean, I mean, come on, I'm standard five, standard six, right? So you don't know about things like 
screen tests of the of the finished film or whatever. But I thought, you know, after the film is finished with the shooting and the editing, you've got your post-production takes forever. And then months after you're done, then only do you discover whether people like what you've done. So yeah, yeah so, so that's why I chose theater. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. I can already see that this is going to be a very animated and this interesting. Yes, please. I'm all for animation. <laughs> Ron, oh, hi. Ron, you know, I, I've been um, following your career. You've organized some fantastic events over the last few years. Uh, maybe you can share with us the background of Think Tank and some of the prominent events that you have done. And, uh, you know, to set the tone. Sure. Why of all the human beings in Malaysia, why did we invite you to join us today? All yours, Ron. All right. Um, thanks, Richard. So, um, I, own, I co-own Think Event and the event company here in Malaysia. So what we do is actually corporate event um, from conferences to launches, gala dinners, award ceremony. Um, although we all started in Malaysia, but actually events have actually brought us everywhere in the world. We have done events in Japan, in, in Europe. We even have um, done in uh, what you call in South Korea. So we have actually traveled quite a fair bit because of events and that's why we actually love events. So. Events is actually very, very, events is very general and it's it's very wide. So what we do is mostly corporate. Um, we don't do road shows. Um, we don't do weddings. Yeah. So we always get that, whether we can do weddings as well. But um, no, we, 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 we can't deal with um, the in-laws. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But interesting, interesting is uh, it, we, we all know that uh, organizing events is super challenging. So many people to pacify and make happy. Uh, yeah. We know, we, we, our, our law firm have been involved in events before, so we totally understand the pressure and problems. Yeah. So Mal, uh, would you like to perhaps um, uh, kickstart this topic? Uh, all, all yours? Oh yeah, all right, okay, great. <laughs> all right, so to kickstart, uh, Ron and, may I call you Ron? Ron yeah, and sure. Chris, um, you guys are in the industry. You guys uh, have been, you know, uh, uh, in the industry for m many, many years. Um, what, because of all this pandemic, uh, what are the challenges maybe that you can tell us? What are the challenges you face uh, because of the pandemic? We start with that first. Yeah, maybe we can start with Ron first. Yeah. Uh, sure. Um... I think the toughest part for us is actually there's too much uncertainty. So our clients can't plan ahead of time. So usually for conferences, we can actually plan it a year ahead. Some, some conferences we plan like two years ahead. But right now we are getting, we are still getting inquiries for events in January. And that's like three weeks down the road. Mm. And usually for corporate events, we don't see that short, um, short lead time Normally we'll have more lead time because of invitation. We need to get um, MCs, entertainers, performers. We, we need to get the invites out. So it's just too much uncertainty um, in, in current time. So it's actually very difficult to do a lot of planning. Um, second biggest challenge for us actually is our clients and a lot of organizers are actually quite unsure about technology. It's too new to many of them and there are just tons of offerings out there and prices are very so clients who actually just look at the bottom right corner figure they're probably jump on the bandwagon for the cheapest uh, quote but what exactly they are getting offered they they have no idea so i think th these two things are actually the, the the biggest challenge for us well that seems to be Something we've kind of noticed the last eight months, nine months, yeah? So we'll come back to you, Chris. Uh, we'll come back to you, uh, Ron. Chris? Sure. How uh, are you? Let, let me steal a page from Ronald's book and say, <laughs> one definitely, yeah, I mean, that, that bad word in uncertainty really is the thing that's playing us. I mean, um, just to give you an idea of how it affects um, the arts uh, or, or, or theatre in particular, um, my theatre company takes usually about uh, a month and a half to two months to rehearse, prep, and uh, you know go into a run of a production. So what happens is, when you have the uncertainty around, you land up with things like, for instance, uh, I don't mind mentioning this to you all. I actually have a 
a musical, a one-man musical that's actually right now in production. Um, we did half of our two-month rehearsal schedule. Uh, we completed that sort of in, um, I think we completed in uh, just before the second batch of uh, CMCO, right? Um, and we, we actually managed to finish that whole block of rehearsals, about five weeks of rehearsal. So now I actually have uh, an e equal amount of rehearsals left, maybe about four more weeks left. But right now, um, we were supposed to have opened last week and, and uh, uh, opened two weeks ago and closed last week. Um, but uh, we pushed the dates to the late January. And now it looks the latest news that I have in discussions with my stage management and my production team, it looks like we are pushing all the way into May uh, of next year. So I have never ever directed a play where I've worked on half of it and then <laughs> put it in the freezer, you know, the, the metaphorical freezer and then pulled it out again, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite, quite, and, and right now, right, because, you know, you can't hold me down, right? You can't hold Theatre 360 down. Right now, we are, I'm, we are actually in the middle of a workshop process for another play uh, that we are wanting to stage next year. But I mean, but get this, right? I, I, I'm doing three workshop sessions on, on consecutive Tuesdays. The third session will be next Tuesday. And then I told my actors, okay, guys, um, we're going to sort of go on a break till July, <laughs> you know, and um, okay. <laughs> yeah. And um, I mean, and it's also a telltale sign when you ask your actors, right, what, 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 what's your availability like for next year? And they go, mm, okay, okay. <laughs> well, at least out of six of my actors, at least four of them gave me that answer. Lah. Um, the first is uncertainty. The second, of course, is... You know, you know, after a while, um, I, I have to admit, uh, Richard, uh, Mal, I, I have to admit that, and uh, Ron, I have to admit that the, the theatre community, and I'm sure the arts community in general, we are a very resilient lot. We're a very stubborn lot. If not, we won't be here. But there, there are limits to this resilience, right? There's limits and there's, 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 yeah. So if you summed up all of this resilience over the first MCO, and then you've got this awesome third, fourth, fifth wave, and all kinds of things happening. And then you go, oh, you know, we've got to go through that rigmarole again. So having to sum summon that resilience and that stubbornness again to to meet the challenges is 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 is, is really quite something, lah. So yeah. So Ron stealing a page from your book, uncertainty. Yes, capital U N C E R T A I N. Yeah. So. <laughs> On that point, Chris, I'll come back to Ron later. Since you're already on that point and you're on a hot streak here, I can see. Um, <laughs> you, it looks like you know, some of your shows are, are, are you know, broken into two. What yeah. do you think, Chris, do you see performing arts in 2021? I mean, we're a few weeks away from 2021. Do, do you have any uh, projected uh, vision of what's going to happen next year? Theatre is something that you won't be able to put down. I can guarantee you there will always be someone out there. I mean, what, what are the basic ingredients of theatre? Okay, the basic ingredients of theatre specifically are an actor and an audience. So it can happen anywhere at any time, right? If you have someone performing, someone reciting something, I mean, that is already theatre once you have an audience. However, um, if you're talking, of course, about the performing arts industry, you're talking about shows, you're talking about all that sort of thing. You know, I mean, because of the nature of the times that we live in, I mean, um, I know for myself as an English theatre company, you know, uh, I, 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 have, um, I have tried to look as, as, as many projects. In fact, actually, um, while we were doing, uh, while we were going through the first MCO, I actually planned for four projects for this second half of the year. Three of them got either cancelled or postponed, leaving the only last one, which is supposed to be in December, right, which is now going to probably happen in May, you know, God bless everyone who's listening to that now. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, the, 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 maybe what I'm trying to say is, you know, it's, very hard, it's going to be very hard to put the theatre co uh, community down because I, I have tons of friends in, let's say, the BM theatre segment of the industry. And they have, right now, I've, my very good friend, the artistic director of Revolution Stage, Karuna Zuan Rodzi, he is in production right now for four different plays. I mean, he's rehearsing four different things, three offline and one online. You know, I mean, his, his days are jam-packed with rehearsals. And I'm going, 
Okay, Abang Wan, how, how, how do you manage all of that? I mean, with all of this uncertainty, we're waiting for this, waiting for that, waiting for a queue here, waiting for a queue there, waiting for the next PM announcement. But there they are, they are full steam ahead, trying to sort things out, I'm sure, with all the SOPs in place. But they're still just steaming ahead, going ahead. You know, they don't seem to have the issue of, you know, whether the audiences will come. I mean, a, a, a good question, right, would be, let's say the MCO finishes today, all right, and I have a play that opens up you know, on Thursday next week, will you come to the theatre and watch that play? Okay, yeah. if you're a hard fan like me, yes, I will come. <laughs> you know, I, I will risk Hello. myself and I'll be there, <laughs> you know. But, but you know, it's, it's the general public we want, isn't it? It's the general public that we want to be interested, involved, buying tickets and all that. So yeah. we are unable to hit mass because of that. So you, you can't rely on the, the diehard fans. So, sorry, Richard, I don't know whether I answered your question, but you did. I know we'll still be around. <laughs> Like, we'll come back that to for sure. <laughs> we'll come back to you, Chris. Yeah, in fact, uh, Mal has something to inquire with Ron. Yeah, so Ron, hmm. same, similar question to what uh, Richard has asked to Chris. What about event planning? Like, what, what do you see event planning will be in 2021? You know, so because right now, hmm. uh, uh, people are scared to go to the events. Yeah. All these SOPs in place. So how do you gain that trust back from the participants? Yeah. You know, um, how, what are the plans? Important question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, there's a few things that I think um, as organizers, we have to look into it. One is actually very effective communications. Um, we need to communicate that, you know, safety and clear protocol before and during the event is being considered. So that's just to give, you know, the attendees that assurance that they will be taken care of. Um, and I feel that the venue staff should also be tested on a regular basis. And this, these are people from, you know, kitchen helper who's preparing the food, the chef, to the, the service who's actually serving the attendees. Um, if I'm an attendee and I know that the people, the staff of this particular venue or hotel has been tested regularly and they, they are very transparent about it, I think that gives me that assurance to be, to be, you know, in person in that event. Um, Second thing that I, I, I noticed that Singapore is actually uh, just finished a hybrid event where they actually have an antigen rapid test um, on site before entering the event. Um, I think that also give people that assurance and certainty that you know it will be safe. Um, there's also, as part of, of the conferences that we do, we target a lot of international delegates. I see. So yeah, so without international delegates, we we are missing that one big chunk in, 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 in that equation for a lot of conferences. Mm -hmm. um, so there's such thing called common pass, where the, the purpose of common pass and also the common trust uh, network is to actually enable um, airline and cross-border travel to, to actually get both travel and the government the confidence. Because when a traveler gets tested, this information or this data is actually safe onto the common pass. So regardless of which airport or which immigration that you're going to, it's easy for them to actually extract the, the information. I think that that it will help as well. Um, contact tracing. I, mm. So far, I think Singapore is also doing that where you'll be given a, a, a small contact tracing dongle. Um, I've shared a picture with you earlier, Richard. Maybe yes. Mark can actually share that. So I think that's very helpful. That, that actually help when, if something do happen, at the event, we can actually trace that particular person whether he has been talking to Mr. A, B, C for how long, or you know, if your hall is so so big, person A who is actually tested positive may not um, may not have contact or come in contact with with anyone who is sitting at the, the other end of the hall, for instance. Yeah. So I think, yeah. Uh, sorry, maybe. Uh... Uh, Ron, now that we have this on the screen, maybe you want to share with the viewers and Chris, mm. uh, myself and Mal, what this uh, photo is about. Okay, this, this was taken from a recent event in, in Singapore. Um, so the orange dongle there is actually a contact tracing uh, dongle where it, it will help to trace who you get close to or you how long you actually stay in, in contact with the other party. Um, and the ART, the antigen rapid test, it, that's where all the participants actually go for the test before they enter the hall. So they get the immediate result, if I'm not mistaken. 
So I think the result, it's only like 20 minutes. You, 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 you will, you'll find out whether you are positive or negative in, in 20 minutes. Yeah. I mean, this is not something that will work in, in, in our line. I think in Chris's line, this definitely will also help to give people that assurance. Yeah, it's, in fact, uh, I dare say this this may may invite more people to take that step forward and attend conferences, conventions. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. what a lot of people don't don't realize is that business events actually bring great uh, impact to our economy. So it's not just about the number of room nights or, or, or how much people spend it at, at, at the shopping mall, but there is actually economy impact. I totally agree, Ron, because I, I noticed uh, for, I mean, people don't realize, I just put this out there, that when they have an event to attend, say, I, I'm going to bring my wife to Chris's uh, theater, right? So of course she would make an effort to dress up where I will, you know, maybe get a new shirt or whatever, like, you know? Then uh, uh, if you go for uh, a, 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 what you call this, a gala dinner, which is organized by Ron, we'll do our hair, the ladies will do manicure, pedicure, the guys will put on the best suit, maybe, you know, yeah. dry cleaning, yada, yada, all this helps economy. Actually, the whole, there's, there's, there's uh, one big ecosystem behind, behind it. Yeah, um, yeah it, it's not just, you know, hotels or event companies that will benefit from it. Yeah. So... Yeah. Chris, uh, I, I, I guess just another comment that I may want to make is on Travel Bubble. I don't know whether you, you've heard mm, of Travel, Bu Travel yeah. Bubble, where you know a few countries will come together and set up uh, restricted uh, uh, countries within them and the borders and whatnot. So I guess in terms of event management, you may, you know, you may be able to take advantage of this, you know, just yes. open up to uh, people from, let's say, Singapore only to come to your event. Hmm. So anyway, um, uh, uh, Chris, another uh, Chris, sorry, Ron, another question I wanted to ask. Sure. Um, I know there are a lot of virtual exhibitions, hmm. right? So can you just uh, share with the viewers and, and with us what will be the differences between in terms of preparation, uh, in terms of virtual exhibitions and hmm. the normal conference physical physical exhibitions? Okay, um, I, I'm not. I'm not an expert in exhibition, but um, what I can say is that right now, when we plan for an event for 2021, the future is actually the hybrid. So you will you will have a physical and also the virtual audience. Okay. So anything that you plan will definitely you need to think of two experiences: one for the virtual and one for the physical attendees. Um, we cannot treat the virtual attendees as a second class citizen where we focus only on the on-site um, attendees. So a lot of things that we, 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 we really need to look into, for example, um, the duration of the session. You know, um, conventional conference, you have keynote session that probably will last 30 minutes to 45 minutes. I think what I believe is that in future, we will need to look into cutting down or having a shorter yet more impactful session because you can't have 45 minutes per session for you know three, four sessions, people virtually will, will, will get tired and, and, and bored. And it has to be more engaging. Probably slides may not work anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For example, your sports conference, Richard, probably <laughs> you will need to change the, the entire format altogether instead mm -hmm. of you know, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m., you probably will need to look into more days, but shorter per day. Yeah. So people can last. Yeah. Yeah, you can't you can't expect people to be staring at the screen for eight hours a day. <laughs> true, true. Yeah. yeah. There's too much distractions. Yeah. So yeah. Chris, um, fantastic points, Ron. And we're going to come back because you raised some really good uh issues, you know, peripheral economy, uh the the ecosystem and I, and I like the technology of events that you mentioned. Uh, I've also noticed that you highlighted the the problem of the online, uh, you know, conferences. It's only so long we can last. Uh, even this webinar, as you know, we are designed only for one hour. And there's a reason why, you know, there's only so much people can watch the four of us talk for an hour. Eh? 
So, um, uh, back, but for you, Chris, you are, yeah. uh, while Ron is the people behind the scene, yeah. you are the scene. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you really right in front of it. I mean, there's a whole idea of a theater, uh, performing arts, etc., uh, etc. Et yeah. um, how do you think you can tackle the um, the apprehension of the spectators to attend your theaters? What What do you think will happen uh, from your point of view? Do you, or do you think you'll be engaging people at Ron to get things organized for you? Well. Um... It's, it's actually very much uh, the same modus operandi as uh, Ronald has mentioned. I, I, I listen with great interest. You know, I, I, I think of awesome users for that, that orange dongle, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love to track all my actors and track all my... But, um, but, 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 but logically speaking, um, um, one of the main issues that we have is the fact that our audience capacity for the if the the, the theaters that, that are open the venues that are open they have been um, reduced by about half 50 percent so that's that's the very first thing so um, in the name of the SOPs in the name of creating you know more space for everybody um, but I, I I think definitely the contact tracing definitely uh, the uh, uh, what Ron said, which is very important, the, the effective communication of all the, the, the safety measures that are in place. Um, but 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 really finding that balance of the offline and the online. So what I think is going to be a trend, which is actually something that's already happening right now, the Dhamansara Performing Arts Center, they did a uh, festival just about two months ago. And what they did was every weekend they had a performance, it's singing, they had, uh, uh, I don't know whether they did dance, but they certainly had m uh, music events. What they did was they, they scheduled something like three performances, two of them were offline, one online. And uh, what they did was, I think they recorded the Saturday night and then they actually premiered that for an online audience on the Sunday. So, you know, so now my producer, uh, my company partner has uh, added troubles to add, added figures to add on to his budget because now he has to, to look at, you know, MCP recordings for theater productions and this and that. Um, in fact, actually, just going back to what I mentioned about Revolution Stage, what they are doing, right? I mean, my, my, my good friend is in four different rehearsal things at the moment. One is online. The other three are all uh, being staged in a proper venue, right? With no audience, but staged with proper lights and proper everything so that uh, it can be recorded by an MCP and then presented. Now, um, I, I, I'm sure um, Richard, Marl and Ron, you all are, uh, I don't know whether you've seen any of the arts online, there's tons of arts online, free stuff, the National Theatre in, uh, in London has, has put out at least about 12 different productions for free. I mean, that is interesting in itself because you're watching the telecast of a theatre production in a theatre with the curtains, with the lights, with the sound and this and that, right? There are now, you know, productions that are coming out that are created specifically for the screen, right? But um, in my humble opinion, you know, um, theatre is a, a, a very much a live thing. It's very much a tangible thing, isn't it? It's, it's, you have to have that tangible quality. I mean, in, in this particular circumstance, it makes sense because right now I'm talking to the three of you. You know, you see me, I see you. It's almost immediate, real time. This is great, right? Because we are engaging one another almost immediately. But when you are doing a piece of theater, record it, you know, one week ago, and then it's premiered at whatever time and played to whoever's watching, whether it's one person, five people, 10 people, 500 people, you know, you don't have that, that direct connection. The, the, the actor needs a two-way, the two-way thing, right? To be able to feed off the vibes of the audience. That's a true thing. I mean, yeah. it really works, right? But now what do they have to feed off? They, they feed off a screen, you know, they give her all this energy and they give her all this attention and it, you know, hits the screen and what happens to it after that, right? So, yeah. you know, not only are there issues for finding ways to bring the audience in, but once they get there, right? Yeah, what, 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 what happens to the, the delivery of the, the product itself? Interesting, interesting. Definitely, okay, we can see that you guys have been, both of you have been really thinking way out of your box to, to solve your problem. Uh, at this juncture, I want to uh, thank the, the few people who logged on on Zoom. And in fact, we, I've been following on Facebook, there are quite a number of people have been watching and it's been shared to many, many pages and groups. Thank you to everybody on Facebook to log on. If you have any inquiries or comments that you would like to leave behind, 
participants in Zoom, there is a chat room here. Put on your comments there. Marlisa and I will address it. And then I also will be monitoring on Facebook to see any comments. Uh, so, Margot, further questions for the speakers? Yeah, all right. So, Chris, you mentioned just now about your challenges or actors' challenges in terms of not getting the connection they need hmm. from the audience, right? But uh, in other parts of challenge, uh, challenges, what about the production itself in terms of rehearsals? How do you do it? I, you know, I, 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 I can't imagine because you need to adhere to all these SOPs. You have all these SOPs in mind. So, you know, actors, you need to, you know, you need to touch, you need to, you know, all this acting. So, how do you deal with that? Okay, Mal, I have three words for you. The three words are, with great difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I have to admit, you know, I'll be the very first person to tell you that if you ask me, okay, Chris, direct this play online, you know, I'll be the first to shout and scream at you lah. You know? <laughs> I'll be the first to want to reach out through this screen and strangle you, you know, because <laughs> I'm just like that. But, um, you know, having said that, uh, just in the last three weeks, I've had it, actually had an awesome opportunity to direct a play online, uh, albeit, you know, it's actually six monologues all tied together into one piece. Um, a very interesting experience, Mal, a very interesting experience, because uh, going back to what I mentioned uh, uh, earlier, um, you know, when you, when you prepare a piece of theatre for the screen, right, you're not, you are, you are, Okay, this is what I told my. This is exactly what I told my actors. I said, "Hey guys, if you think you're doing online theater, that is rubbish. You're not doing online theater. You're doing video. That's what you're doing. Okay? <laughs> you're putting together a nice video. You know, it's 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 no longer about the connection between the audience and the actor and all that thing. I mean, we can we can sort of bluff it. <laughs> we can sort of try and uh, artificially create it or summon it. But you see, the thing is." Right now, what is missing is the fact that, you know, I mean, if, if we're not on Zoom, right, if we're not doing a, a Zoom stage reading of a play or whatever, what happens is you totally lose the reaction of the other person. So I have no idea whether you just enjoyed my joke. I have no idea whether you're crying right now. I have no, and, and, and without that, that tactile connection, then the actors really have to second guess, the directors to second guess. So um, one of the awesome things about this MCO and, and my good friend COVID, I mean, you know, um, bouquets of flowers to COVID because I become a film director overnight. <laughs> you know, I, I've been thinking about making that transition from theater to film for six years. In 2014, I thought about my first short film that I wanted to do, but you know, I, I you know, as per usual, you know, us arts people, you know, so many things to think about, lots of insecurity, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> I sat there and I just said, you know, I, I want to know A to Z about filmmaking and blah, 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 until, you know, COVID hits and you go, okay, all right, I'm given an art ceremony that I have to now convert from offline to online. How do I do it? Do that. And then now um, I'm, I'm sorting out, I've just finished sorting out this production and it's an hour, 15 minutes long. It's literally a full length feature. So I'm like, I apologize, everyone. I actually wanted to break into the scene with a short film, but I'm so sorry. You've got a full length feature from Mila. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, well, fake audience work. Um, fake audience, huh? Okay, when mm. you say fake audience, the first thing I think of is James Corden on the late <laughs> show and his little button thing, which I think is awesome, his little button thing, which he's still using right now, even though he's got audience there, right? Still using. Yeah. Um, fake audience is difficult, lah, Ron, to be honest. Mm. You know? I mean, what we can do is we can always second guess, we can always yeah. uh, sort of predict how they will react or whatnot, yeah. but really... You're on your own, right? I mean, when you... It's, yeah. it's going back to that analogy that I was telling you about, right? Where you have the difference between film and theatre. And in film, you wait, right? Until you get audience response. Whereas in theatre, it's immediate live response. Yeah. So, I mean, okay, now, um, I, I'm sure you all will say, okay, but Chris, if you're not recording your performances, if you're not doing a national theatre thing or whatever, or if you're styling your stuff, why not webcast your shows? Well, webcasting shows works. You can live stream, I can live stream a performance. But as you know, bandwidth sometimes is a problem. You know, yeah. uh, you get all you get all those things. So actually, most most channels I know, uh, cloudtheaters.com, which is a very good online platform right now uh, for uh, online arts. Yeah, across the board in BM English, mm -hmm. right through right through. 
I mean, uh, for them, what I think, I think even Deepak wanted to do live streaming. They, 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 they say it's live streaming, but what's been happening uh, of late is they pre-record the show and then it's easier lah, just to ensure that they can just press play. The whole thing plays. You don't have any interruptions. You don't have any problems with uh, audio, visual and that sort of thing, you know. Many, many factors to play, Richard. Well, many factors to play, many factors to play. Sure, sure. But that's an interesting thing, Ron. Yeah. I wish I could convert my audiences into that little box and press buttons like James Corden. I really wish I could do that. Maybe, maybe we all need to talk to Netflix. Ah, Netflix. <laughs> ah, okay. Yes. <laughs> we, did, we had one recording a uh, couple of weeks ago. So the, the person in front of the green screen couldn't really um, perform. Mm. Oh. So, so what we did was we actually put a few people to sit in front of her. Uh, yeah, so that she she feel more comfortable. Yeah, some people just can't can't interact or can't uh, speak in front of cameras, so they just need to have human yes. in front of them. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we did that, and it actually helped. In fact, for my actors, um, because they've only just been recording their little monologues, right? So there's six of them, yeah. all recording their own ten minute monologue. I, I told them straight in the face, hey guys, look, you know, this is not online theater, right? It's video. So you're just going to be faced with this camera. So all I can mm. do is I can scold you now so that you remember all these points. And then as you're performing and as you're doing so the you play. play, you will hear my voice, <laughs> you know, reminding you of all of these things. And you will be able to hopefully, you know, pinpoint and, and well, I mean, we, we have tricks, right? In the sense that, you know, you, you map out the emotional journey of the character throughout a monologue. So you say, okay, you know, I'm going to hit this mark, hit this mark, hit this mark, hit that mark, and then, you know, go about it that way. But yeah, I mean, one of the intrinsic ingredients is missing. And that's the thing that I miss terribly. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, I totally agree with you, Ron. You know, an audience of five, an audience of 20, which is now the the... the the legit capacity of my theatre in Subang Jaya, right? It's dropped yeah. from 40 people to about 20 people. I mean, but hey, 20 people, yeah, let's do it, you know? And that's what I was actually trying to do before lots of other things happen, lah, you know? There, there are so many other factors, like for instance, you know, your budget um, has things like uh, performing license fees that are not dropped, you know? Especially if you want to do a foreign piece of work, you know? And, and that sort of thing, lah, yeah. Um... So, uh, gentlemen, um, we've heard your passionate views. Um, I, 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 if I can summarize, for those who just logged on, um, both Chris and Ronald has shared their current observation of what's happened in the last 10 months. In short, it's bad. And uh, <laughs> uh, they also shared with us, uh, I mean, we're not just here to complain uh, and lament. Mm -hmm. I'm very proud that Chris and Ron both have actually sort out ideas to find solutions. You see, Chris literally have to think out of the box and have a theatre outside the box. And we all know the theatre is all about in the box. And then uh, Ron is looking at uh, orange cubes and whatever to try and get technology. in. But uh, recently, uh, Chris uh, and Ron, the government issued some comments about budget in, in the budget. And I know about uh, 15 million ringgit is uh, allocated for arts and culture and another um, uh, set of budget uh, for business events, which uh, wasn't that, that uh, much, but there are some budgets there. So uh, moving forward from a business and, and marketing point of view, uh, what do you think, Ron, about the, the budget of luck this year, which will help, uh, how much can it help the business of events next year? The budget, um... <laughs> you know, I, think, <laughs> I can see that. Oh, the budget. <laughs> My response to. <laughs> yeah. But I, I must say that um, like for, for business events, we, we, we are blessed that we have um, support from our National Bureau, MISA, and also we also have State Bureau who actually do give subsidies and, and funding when we organize uh, events. So previously, maybe we need to have X number of um, international delegates, but because of the travel travel ban, the borders are still closed. Um, they actually come up with new campaign where if this homegrown events for local, that they will also support. So I think that that is good effort and initiatives from, from the bureaus 
Mm. So, because yeah. from what we've seen so far, Ron, the reason why I asked you first is because uh, personally, Mal and I could not find a substantive allocation of the budget for events industry. In fact, uh, the Malaysian Association of Convention and Exhibition mm. Organizing uh, Association, uh, they issued a statement that the budget didn't help the event industry. Yeah. yeah. So that's, yeah. A, that's very unfortunate. That's very unfortunate. Yeah. So with that uh, slight uh, impediment, okay, not slight, it's a major impediment. Uh, still, moving forward, what do you think we can do as Rakyat, as a Malaysian, mm. helping each other, and in this case, helping the event industry? What can we do to help the event industry? I think um, we will see events coming back if we don't have the numbers, the, 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 the positive cases, you know, that goes up. Um, I think the biggest fear right now for, for us is actually to be a super spreader event. So for as long as we can, we can all cooperate as, as yeah, not just for events, but for, for the country itself. Mm. Events will come back eventually. Yeah, I guess we all have to literally wash our hands all the time together and uh, yeah. together and create a very, very big bubble called the Malaysian bubble. Uh. Yeah, and I think like the um, past two days, the Minister of Tourism, um, she mentioned that there are certain areas that will be opened up, certain sectors will be opened up, and MICE is actually one of it, business events is one of it. And there'll be, they'll probably will be starting off with a few countries, business travelers who can actually fly in to Malaysia to attend conferences and events. Mm. So I think it, it's just a matter of time. Um, we just have to, to be patient. Yeah. But of course, if, if government can, can give extra help in terms of the funding and all that, I think the industry will really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hope so too. Well, yeah. we'll come back to you again, Rob, because uh, it's sure. 20 now. I'm going to go towards the last leg of a discussion with Chris and then later on we invite the two of you to give your summary and let's see whether there's any comments and questions from the public. Um, Chris, uh, what about you? Uh, we, we are fortunate because uh, the arts community is, we make a lot of noise. <laughs> very loud, you. very vocal, very bold, very... Um, uh, you know, we are, we are blessed because we have arts organizations, mediaries like uh, Kakisini, like Chindana, um, who actually uh, help to um, mediate, help to look after, help to address issues that, that come up as an industry. Chindana as well has actually been very, very active in terms of allocating funding through many, many different sponsorship programs. I'm sure you've seen the huge variety that is online, you know, and, and, and I, I, you know, I mean, the arts industry is, is certainly not um, restricted from creating online products, right? So one of the very first few initiatives, you know, during the first MCO was really to create as many opportunities for them to create stuff online. Um, uh, for, for theater companies like myself, you know, we, we, I guess we need to try and find we, 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 we have to be very smart and very, very, uh, we, we really need to have our nose to the ground to really sniff out, you know, the funding, find, find that. Um, mm. I, I, I have to say, I have to say, Ma, I have to say, Ron, that um, we were, uh, Theatre 360 was every, actually privileged to be part of a, um, a Malaysia's uh, first virtual arts festival called Gera Angin. Uh, we put in a piece called Synesthesia. My company part partner directed it. It was a physical piece of theatre, well, uh, run run time about twelve minutes, something like that. You know, all, all sort of prepared nicely for the YouTube generation. You know, but um, but the 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 thing about it was it was very well supported by um, the uh, Ministry of Tourism and uh, Arts and Culture, uh, also a huge support from uh, JKKN, um, and. Um, you know, I mean, each and every one of these bodies actually have put out very clear initiatives to try and get things going, you know. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a matter of ensuring that the, the funding actually reaches the right people at the right time. You know, uh, we've been blessed. You know, my venue has, uh, has been able to uh, at least go, go through a few of those hoops to get some funding to sort itself out a little bit. Uh, in fact, my venue actually is a 
a joint venture with another different company. So we are quite blessed for that opportunity pre-COVID. Um, and, uh, and of course, and of course uh, uh, the musical that I mentioned much earlier in the show uh, is also uh, funded under Chandana as well. Yeah, so we're really, really pleased to have the opportunity to still do work, lah, you know. And um, our involvement with Gerak Angin also uh, provided us also some much, much needed financial support as well. Uh, that's, that's, that's great, Chris. Well, since we are in this topic about funding business and whatnot, can I just ask the two of you, uh, maybe Ron can start, um, in terms of costs for uh, your event, like for example, if Ron does a virtual event, how do you balance um, the expectation of your audience or your participants? They might question, or oh, why do you charge this much for a virtual event when physical event you charge this much? So how do you balance that in business? Uh, will that even uh, will that affect your cost and your profits? And you know, good question. Yeah, good question. Okay, I, I think it depends um, the audience size. So. What I can say is that a lot of people assume that once you go virtual, it will be cheaper. <laughs> yeah. But it's not necessarily the case. Mm. Yeah. Um, how do we balance it? Well, if for example, if you're going to do a virtual event, a virtual conference, previously probably you have 200 people attending in person. The good news right now is that once you go virtual, you can actually hit a thousand people. The question that people always have is that, okay, now that we're going virtual, are we going to charge less for the tickets? Mm. I can tell you not necessarily. So it all depends how you package the, the, the tickets. So in person, you probably charge, let's say 400 US dollars for two days of conference. So you can still charge the same for virtual, but you give them additional, which is 12 months access to the materials. For example, you can also add in an, ex an exclusive, um, um, backstage interview with the keynote speakers, with certain artists, for example. Yeah. So, because you need to do a, you have to mix pre-recording and live to an event. The cost will actually go go to, you know, the all the prep work, all the pre-recording, yeah. renting of studios. Yeah, yeah, true, true, true. Yeah. yeah, I don't believe in doing a conference or an event where it's hundred percent live. Yeah. There will be some pre-recorded, yeah. You will definitely need some pre-recorded material in order to fill up the um, the in-between fillers, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because unlike unlike a live event, it is okay to see people walk up the stage. <laughs> but in virtual, you really don't want to see people walk up the stage. Or let's say the the most common um, issue that we have, the VIP is late. <laughs> so what are you gonna do? You know, yeah. VIP in a holding room, probably talking to certain other VIPs, they will walk into the ballroom late. So what, what are you going to do to entertain the, the, the virtual audience? You can't just let them watch a blank screen or just keep on playing the, 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 the e-backdrop, the backdrop design. Mm. So there's a lot of material that you need to really consider. So for me right now, to actually do a virtual event, it's like to do a, a TV show. You really need to visualize from the moment you go live, what your audience will see. Yep. So it, it's like a whole storyboard altogether that you, you really have to think it through. You no longer be able to say, you know, this person walks in, walks out, next person walks in. It, <laughs> no longer like that. Yeah. What, what about you, Chris? <laughs> this business issue, this issue of a business cost for arts and performance and theatres? Um... Putting on theatre has always been a challenge. I mean, even pre-COVID days, you know, um, if you if you say, you know, hey, you know, you can charge X amount, you know, ticket sales will have you sailing through. That's certainly not the case. And uh, for my theatre company as well, being, you know, we are, we are a young theatre company. So, and in a space that can only seat 40, maybe maximum 50 people, you got to really be very smart about what you do. So, for instance, I, I already cut corners, right? I cut corners with, you know, um, no extravagant sets and you know extravagant costumes. However, what is really necessary is good acting, right? Good engaging acting. So that was what we were doing pre-COVID. Now post-COVID, you know, 
um, yes, we have to cater to the live audience. We've got to cater to the off the, the, the online audience. You know, um, there's the cost involved in converting. Uh, I mean, right now, I, I would love for my black box theatre, my 50-seater theatre in Subang, instead of gathering dust, I would love for it to, you know, have productions that are flowing in and out of that space and for it to be equipped as a full studio, right? Uh, where it can be live telecast, you know, whatever it might be. I mean, that's the, the sort of cost that we're talking about, right? To move from one paradigm to another paradigm, this is what we are having to look at. And um, of course, the cost is not exactly, you know, something that we can handle. But um, the only thing that I tell myself and I tell my company partners is, although we, we are constantly talking about this, I mean, we, we, we're, we're talking about things like, uh, is there a need for us to go digital, right? Is there a need for us to pump out those dreaded online productions, you know, God forbid, you know. But I mean, if, if that is the way it's got to be, it's got to be, you know. If, if that's the way it's going to happen, it's going to happen. I mean, hey, you know, <laughs> I just finished one three weeks ago. So, you know, so it's, it's done, right? So if you can do one, you can do another one, you can do another one, you can do another one and do that sort of thing. But I mean, but, but, but more importantly, it's about engagement, right? It's about audience development that continues. It's about engagement. And the cost that is involved, well, you know, um, the, what my company partner, partner loves to tell me is, you know, all, all in its own time, right? It, it costs money. A camera costs money. You know, well, well, having said that, I mean, the, I mean, we all know that the cost of these things, I mean, you don't need a fan dangle black magic camera to shoot your, your, your thing. You, you just need your, your, your iPhone 12 Pro Max, whatever it is. Yeah, you need that. You just need that, right? You just need a fancy little thing, right? But, but it's all cost, you know, and um, I'm sure, I'm sure things will, things have to sort themselves out in yeah. some way. I mean, if we're intending to work down that way, we have to shoot for that. And for me, uh, if you ask me, uh, business-wise, it makes sense to convert my studio, my theater space into a, 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 a fully functioning video, video, whatever, video capable space. Yeah. But hey, I mean, finances is the issue, but we'll have to wait and see. Yeah. No? I have to laugh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> tough. It's, it's tough times now. Mm, I guess tough times need tough measures and... Uh, yes. And only, only the tough gets so what, 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 yes. when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. And yep. Say, yep. Yep. Well, yeah, so. I, we saw one comment here on Facebook, uh, comment asking um, about uh, the um, how would uh, how would you manage spectators at events in these coming months? So I, I, I suppose the question is for both of yep. you. Ron, you want to try first? In the coming months, let's say you have an event, I think the, the person who hmm. asked the question is quite a good question. How would you want to manage spectators in the coming months? In a live, uh, in, a, in a live you, event. I think the question is about people coming into a, a hall, back to the good old mm -hmm. conference. Uh, how, how would you manage the? If you have conference next month, how would you manage it? I will actually look into the um, the whole SOPs and also the venue. Mm -hmm. um, previously. We will actually look at the venue, like which venue has a has a brand, better branding or nicer chandelier, nicer ballroom. But I can tell you right now, um, things that we consider when we plan for an event, looking at the venue is definitely the size of the foyer space, whether it makes sense compared to you know the ballroom size. I so see. you get instances whereby you have really tiny foyer, but you have huge ballroom for a thousand pax, for example. Then that is putting, you know. The, the attendees at risk so we all have to think of the floor which door goes in that particular door probably is only for entry and another door is only for exit um a lot of safety measures that we, we have to look into we need to probably have um the the what we call the medical personnel on site as well mm -hmm. but like what singapore is doing all these rapid tests i think that is necessary if we can if moh allows if there is an approved um system or solution to that i think that will definitely help to give the assurance to the attendees um managing the fmv part meals makan is a big thing for us asia yeah. for us Asian, so <laughs> how are we going to manage that but i think um, there's a lot of things that we need to to really restructure or, or, or redesign i would say for an event to make sure that you take care of the safety and yet you don't um 
forego or, or uh, overlook on, on the experience part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So now we have to think how we're going to do that working without alcohol, Richard. <laughs> hey, well, alcohol is good. Alcohol will shoo away the COVID. <laughs> <laughs> I like how uh, Ronald, uh, he looks like, the, I think the question was uh, a quite a good question. Yes. Think out of the box. Huh? Then yeah. uh, what, what about you, Chris? There's one more question coming in. What about you, Chris? Uh, how would you manage spectators if, in, I mean, hypothetically, if you have an event in January, you're allowed to have an event in January, how would you manage spectators now? Okay, um, maybe maybe it's a blessing in disguise, but we would just have to, well, for, for Theatre 360 at Loteng, our venue in Subang Jaya, we would just have to worry about the venue, right? So, yes, actually, it's really interesting that you bring that up, Ron, about the small foyer space, because my theatre has a small foyer space. We literally are the top floor. Sorry. Of the, you know, <laughs> of, no, 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 it's, it's, no, it's really cool. It's, it's really cool that you mentioned that, because... We've had this. I've had this discussion with my team before, and we we're talking about how the audience waits downstairs and the staggered seating, you know, that sort of thing. I've seen this done in the U.S., right? So, I mean, I mean, let's face it, Richard Mal, you know, uh, theaters in the U.S., theaters um, in 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 um, in Australia. Well, but but but, but I, I think my references are more the U.S. and the U.K. Many mm. many many case studies of theaters that open, you know, they, 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 they remove half of their seating, they take it all out, a certain door, let's rows A, B, and C seat, you know, it's all at a certain time, you know, in, in, in five minute uh, intervals and that sort of thing. Of course, for me, I'm in favor of a tiny bit more of a relaxed sort of thing. However, you know, if that's the way it's going to be, that's the way it's going to be, right? If you need to sit these 20 people, you know, five minutes, five people come in and stagger, you know, and all of that. Yep, it is a bit of a quote unquote inconvenience, but if that's the way it has to be for the SOPs and for the health and safety of everybody involved, let's do it. We we, we need to get that done, you know. Um yeah, so 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 for us it's more venue management in that in that sense. My heart goes out to you, Ron, because you have so much more. You got makan as well, you know. Thank God I can chase my audiences away after the show and go go makan somewhere else. <laughs> Go discuss the, you know, you want to say things about my play also, it's okay, don't do it under my roof, go somewhere else, go somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> you know, listening to the two of you, uh, I think people must learn to realize, uh, I really hope this message will go out, that, you know, uh, holding a theater is not just about two persons talking on stage. Uh, having an event is not just about uh, putting up people on a stage to talk. There are a lot, a lot of things which have to go on uh, pre-COVID, uh, current COVID and post-COVID. People yes, like Ron and Chris, uh, I think Mal and I can, can really say this with full of conviction that uh, there is a lot of prep work behind to get things done. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. Um, there's a very interesting question, uh, Chris, but I'm going to put this to uh, Ronald first. There's one gentleman by the name of Gregory Ling uh, asking a question. I wonder who, I wonder who he is. <laughs> 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 How much would a rapid test be and is there a possibility to include that in the cost of tickets? Uh, maybe, Ronald, first, I ask the question again. How much are the rapid tests will be put on the cost and is it possible to include the cost of the rapid test in the tickets? What about you, Ron? What? Um, I have no idea how much it will cost. Um, but I think what we can do is we can actually incorporate it into the, the, the registration fee mm. or it could be part of Part of their travel insurance if, if they are non non Malaysians, yeah. That would be better, yeah. I mean, I'm just speaking out loud. I'm not sure how that will really work, but I, yeah, I think that's one of the possibility. Yeah, I think it's all about uh, gaining people's trust, right? People's confidence, yeah. And having that will will, will do. so. Chris, you want to answer Greg's question? <laughs> okay, no idea how much a rapid. Uh, antigen test would cost. I read just today, actually, uh, fortunately, that a COVID test costs uh, RM two hundred forty to to get. You know, um, it will be suicide, artistic suicide for us to charge. You know, our ticket price, which is you know really <laughs> compared to two hundred forty ringgit, right? But I mean, but you know, I I really listen with interest, Ron. I really listen with interest about the fact that you know if if this antigen rapid test could be done right outside the door, you get your results in 20, wow, that is really quite a game changer. I mean, I haven't even got past the orange dongles yet. I think that is so awesome. 
you know, I mean, no point tagging all our audience, right? Because, you know, they're unfortunately going to land up in that seat and then <laughs> sit there for however long it is and, you know, sneeze and do all their things with their mask on all the time yeah. and complain later that they can't, can't breathe or whatever it might be. I think the most important thing is that we get our audiences into a place where they are feeling safe, secure, able to mm. actively what's going on, isn't it? Yeah, but but that, that's a good point. I mean, it, it probably is quite cool, right? If the antigen test gets part of your, your fee and then you come in, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if it's a multiple days conference or it's a, it, it's it's an industry conference, I think it's worth it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Almost definitely. Yeah. Yeah, we have come to an end. Yeah, we are almost coming to an end. <laughs> so it's 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 been a very interesting discussion today. I would say a lot of uh, views from stakeholders like yourself, and I, I guess it, it will be very beneficial for especially spectators and participants for what they can expect in 2021. You know, from events, from theaters, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So before we end this, maybe um, Ron and Chris, you may want to summarize or give like um, your your views on or, or your wish. For 2021. Ron, you want to start with that? I'll let Chris go first. Okay, Chris. <laughs> go ahead, Chris. <laughs> Ron, I'll see you later. <laughs> What's your Christmas? Um, yeah. um, like I mentioned, Richard, Mal, Ron, um, uh, thank you so much for having us on, on this program. Um, it's really awesome. Um, but you know what? I, I said this earlier and it bears repeating. Um, the, the theatre community, the arts community in general, we are a really stubborn lot. You know, we are really, really stubborn. You will not get us out of your eyes and ears and hands and whatever. You know, we're here to stay whether you like it or not. You know, and we will, we, you know, we're creative, we're artistic. That's what we call ourselves, right? So, you know, there is bound to be a way to get round and solve and sort things out. And I'm very, very confident of that. We are a very, very resilient lot. You know, the, the, the issue right now is the continuing of audience development and the continuing of being able to manage the times where your resilience level is not so high, right? Your resilience level could have been high in March, but right now it could be something else, right? And that really is, for me personally, the, the challenge, right? Many things you hear about mental illness, mental health issues, yeah. those sort of things, it's right across the board, right? It's not just the arts, it's right across the board. So. Yeah, I mean, just ending on that note, lah, you know, staying positive, staying, you know, and, and looking for the opportunities and finding them, you know, yeah, and weathering it out. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for oh, joining us, by the way. Um, Ron? Yeah. You... I, I think um, we, whether we like it or not, we, we just have to uh, accept this challenge um, and all these changes that may go through in our industry. So whatever happened to us or whatever happened to the industry, I think it's, it's how we choose to respond. Sometimes I feel that we can complain a lot about what we are not getting support from. Yeah. Um, but maybe we, we have to look in other ways. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, uh, both Chris and Ronald. Um, we feel you and <laughs> So, uh, but can I uh, first say uh, well done to the two of you for uh, you know really staying alive and surviving and now evolving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for sharing your time with us uh, for the last one. Um, Thank you for having us. Yes, yeah. uh, cheers, cheers, cheers. Uh, uh, my partner and I are happy to have you here. I would like to thank the people who logged on. We see quite a lot of people coming in and out of the Facebook uh, and uh, the people here on Zoom. Thank you so much for logging on. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Thank you for the support. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah. Can we invite everybody to give a round of applause to our speakers? I think they really... Thank you. <laughs> well done, well done. So, with that in mind, uh, we'll bring this to a conclusion. Uh, it, is, uh, it is a different times now, ladies and gentlemen. We, do, we, we can't just walk out and have a meal without having a mask on our face. Uh, so, uh, but it doesn't mean that uh, our life cannot uh, move on. Uh, we always evolve, we always change. And uh, I think this is something we just need to just get on with it and get used to it. I really, really hope, we both really hope that uh, both the theatre performance scene and the, um, the uh, events, industry scene will come back 
maybe not as uh, strong as it was before COVID-19, but stronger than this year. And hopefully by the end of next year, things will be back to good again. The, the, mm. And the vaccine will definitely give some confidence to the public. Right? All right, with that, I want to say to everybody, thank you so much. And if I don't see you, uh, have a good year end. Uh, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, wash your hands. And uh, <laughs> well, from now on, uh, all I can say is together, we will prevail. And we must do it together. All right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Ron. Thank Bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.